Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode, well this is technically part 2 of the round table of the many lives of the Evil Dead book that we discussed a few weeks back with Ron, Betsy, and uh, Jeffrey, and speaking on that note, with the returning guests, we have Ron Ricky uh, back to join us, possibly talk about the uh, outcome of the event that went on. And then joining us today, too, is Andre Wu. Oh, here we go with that French name again. Uh, Wu Wuisel, Wu Wuisel, or something like that. I... Louisel. Louisel, yeah. <laughs> and then finally, we got uh, Stephen Hall. Welcome. Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining. I hope uh, everybody listening to can en enjoy the ride as well from last time. Just like here is part two. So let's begin. You guys are in the book that Ron here has helped edit and stuff. And um, it's, I must say it's pretty fascinating when I first talked with Ron with Tessa. What Tessa is, um, she's here, but she just wants to... Um, do a couple things around here so i'm just uh bolt wagging it right now so but it's okay it's all good um anyway so evil dead is coming up on a anniversary if it has not already passed i believe which it did um and we're here to talk about once again the book and on on top of that andre here mm -hmm. actually did a bit in the book for like um the evil dead musicals and the theoretical embarrassments what are you yeah, the, yeah go ahead yeah go ahead what can you tell us about the uh the musicals and the fear what led to like the theoretical embarrassments or however it went yeah yeah um well uh as you as you know there's been a, a musical now for about 15 years it's been touring it actually started in, in canada where i'm from uh and and sort of went through a, a few versions uh in, in very small theaters in canada and eventually found its way um off um, off broadway and that's when it started to pick up and the version that i actually saw most recently was in uh, was in vegas and it, it was quite an interesting version um, as I say in my uh, in my article, I talk about the uh, the theatricality of embarrassment um, that uh, sort of creates a sense of of horror on stage. The play itself, the musical itself, has sort of gotten rid of all the elements of horror of the original um, Evil Dead, um, which is really the the only um, uh, the only installment in the all the uh, the franchise that I would call a horror film. The original. Uh, Evil Dead, everything else is much more towards comedy. There was already a lot of comedy in the original, but everything that followed is much more comedy. And the musical certainly emphasizes more the, the comedic aspect, a very campy humor. Uh, and of course, there are songs and dance, so all of this makes it very, very um, uh, humorous rather than, than scary. But there's remain, my argument is that there remains an element of fear in the musical um, which is uh, created by a sense that the uh, uh, the performance itself might go wrong any minute. It's very amateurish, even if the actors themselves are professionals, it's very amateurish, and there's all sorts of um, special effects that are quite bad, and there's always a fear that something is going to go wrong, that one of the special effects is going to go wrong, that one of the actors is going to miss their lines, that the, some of the songs are not going to come out the way they should. So the performance, the point that I make is that even if the musical is primarily a comedy and there's very, very little horror, strangely enough, it still creates a sense of dread in the audience because there's a fear that these very amateurish actors and bad special effects and bad makeup and all of that is all going to flop. So from beginning to end, as spectators, at least I was, um, terrified that this was just going to be... Uh, a very embarrassing production, uh, as it sometimes turns out to be. Sometimes it's fine, but uh, sometimes it does turn out to be an embarrassment. And I think that, interestingly enough, that's where the the musical itself creates a sense of fear more in the, the, the fear that it will all fall apart more than in any of the content of the, uh, of the musical itself. That's pretty impressive. And I mean, 
uh, just out of curiosity, is there own how many? If you know even the answer to this, but do you know how many musicals for the Evil Dead there um, have been throughout the years? Oh, there's been uh, there's been a lot. I can't give you a number, but since about two thousand five or six, it's been playing quite regularly. So we're playing. We're talking about about thousands of performances, some of which in professional environments others in very, very amateurish environments, uh, and the, the ones that are um, in the, the more amateur environment uh, tend to create even more fear because it's even more likely that the whole thing is going to, is going to fall apart. Um, so the, the, it has been very successful insofar as you know, there's a big following for the evil dead, um, but I'm, it, it is usually not a very successful performance in the traditional sense because there's always things that go wrong and things that actually go on, wrong on purpose. The campiness and the amateurish quality of the play is there on purpose precisely so as to, to create dread in the spectator, always wondering if uh, the, spec the, the actors are going to forget their lines and stuff like that. So it's all part of the performance, but sometimes it actually happens by mistake, and that's when it's really terrifying. Mm. It, it's interesting. I just, I just looked online, and there's like... 21 productions that are happening uh oh my god and there are so many past productions all over the world japan so thousands Korea, spain yeah. i didn't oh my god there, <laughs> there's a huge list i didn't even realize it was that big of a list oh my goodness yeah there's in ontario uh, upcoming in Cal california oklahoma missouri minnesota is basically everywhere and one of the advantages is that it can be performed for quite cheap because, again, the cheapness of the set, the cheapness of the special effects, that's all part uh. of the production. So pretty much anyone can put it on with very, very little investment. And, of course, there are productions that are slightly more um, you know, professional-looking and are in bigger theaters and whatnot, but generally it's a, it's a play that anyone can put on. So there's a ton of professional performances, but also thousands of amateur performances in schools and stuff like that so it uh, it lends itself very well for that sort of, of environment that's true and it makes me wonder how many times they even had to practice and they still get the lines wrong too so uh, yeah, i think that they they practice getting them wrong they, they they seem to cultivate this sense of improvisation that that again makes spectators nervous that is true some people do have uh stage fright so that's probably mm -hmm. what happens as well where mm -hmm. during practice it's all easy but then when it comes to the real deal yeah yeah it, it gets a little bit more frightening on stage because you want to make sure that you do your best and you don't forget the line so mm -hmm. there, it is true there is that as well can i add one thing to, to andre uh i went to los angeles and i saw an improv show and it was uh, improv comedy, and um, one of the actors was was an actor who had played uh, Jason Voorhees in Friday the Thirteenth. He's uh, he also does comedy, and so uh, so then they asked for a suggestion at the beginning of the show, and uh, it was it was a suggestion of something about horror, and I was like, oh my god, this is gonna be brilliant because I get to see this Jason Voorhees actor, I can't remember his name, <laughs> bald guy, uh, really funny, and then the whole improv team did a, a full like it was a full. Uh, improv, uh, like a, 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 a one of those uh, you know, camp uh, um, serial killer type type films, but they did it uh, theatrically on stage, but as comedy. But it was also, interestingly enough, one of the scariest things that I've ever seen because they were so good at playing with shadows and creeping up on these people and stuff. But then they would, you know, and then they would, it would break into something that was comical. But it reminded me of Evil Dead. It was, and it reminded me of the exact qualities that Andre is talking about right now, where you're on the edges of your seat because you have no idea what's going to happen because it's being made up on the spot. It was one of the coolest theatrical events I've ever gone to in my life because it had this that stage reality thing, this this thing where you're mm -hmm. you're you're a little bit uneasy and have no idea what's going to happen. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I I was uh, trying to get to. I guess you were more articulate than I was, but this sense of you never know what's going to happen next. Unlike unlike on a on a film, uh, especially if you've seen the film a thousand times, like Evil Dead, then, then 
of course, you enjoy seeing the same things over and over again. That's the pleasure of horror films, obviously. Uh, but when it's on stage, you actually do not know what's going to happen next. Even if you saw a production just yesterday, this one might be quite different. Uh, and it is this sort of stage horality where you're nervous, you're giggling, but you're also quite afraid of what might happen next because you literally do not know. And that can always lead up to the frightening thing of we don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. and. We don't know the outcome. And I think that uh, the musical does that very well. And again, very much on purpose that you don't know if they're going to screw up or if it's just going to be, you know, smooth sailing. And you don't know if the music is going to uh, come on cue and things like that. And so there, there's this sense of, of um, humor. You know that all of this is for fun and no one's going to get hurt. But at the same time, you actually don't know what's going to happen next. And it makes everyone quite nervous in the, in the theater. Yeah, I want to chime in one more time because, because with that point on you are making is really interesting. There's, there was one time I went to a, see a play in uh, Suore Dada in Chicago, and it's a, a play that's completely improv with these actors that are like wearing almost like ghost makeup. And uh, I, wa- I walked in late because parking in Chicago and stuff like that. And when I walked in there in the middle of the play, and again, this is a play that largely is being improv. Uh, and they stopped, and they're uh, again. They're wearing. They all look like ghosts, to be honest. With you. They all look like they had died the way that their makeup and clothing was. And they're doing their lines, and they all stopped. All the actors on stage stopped, and they slowly turned to me and stared at me because I was walking in late. And so then I, I started to move to my seat, and then they started very slowly. Actors all started walking towards me, and it scared me so much I ran out of the theater. <laughs> and, I was outside, I was like, and I was like, okay, well, I got to go back in there, but I'm worried now because they're targeting me. <laughs> and, and so in the audience is all laughing, but I was freaked out because if you have a bunch of people who in a dark theater are all dressed and looking like ghosts with really good makeup and clothing, and they'll start walking to you silently, it's freaky. So then I was like, okay, here we go. I got to get back in this thing. So I walked back in again. And I, this time they, they sort of let me get closer to my seat and I start, you know, when you're, you're, you're starting to go in between people and so you're not, now you're a little bit trapped because you're in both of the rows. And mm-hmm. so they stopped though. They, they didn't start walking towards me, but they all stopped. And then I sat down. The moment I sat down very slowly and they had stopped speaking now again, they all started walking towards me. And then what they did is they started climbing over seats to get to me from all directions. So I couldn't move. I'm in my seat, and I have all these like ghostly figures <laughs> climbing over seats, and and then they surrounded me, and then they just stared at me silently. The whole audience was just laughing their ass off, just dying <laughs> laughing, and I it was one of the scariest moments of my life because they're all just surrounding, not going. And I just like started saying like, please stop, and then they and then it, all in the, at like almost at the same time, they all just turned, went back to the stage, and, and started doing the play again. It was it was mm-hmm. brilliant. And I think I think one of the things Andre is talking about when I think of two of the scariest moments of my life, they're both theater theatrical events. You know, I'm not thinking of film, but I'm actually thinking of these theater moments where I was actually there was a bit of being really terrified. Yeah, yeah, that that can happen um, in in some of the performances that I've seen. Not necessarily just the Evil Dead musical, but some horror plays, uh, and very often the it's. It's a different kind of fear. It's what I refer to as mortification. And I'm sure that in that case, when you were being targeted by the actors, it must have been totally mortifying because, yeah, you're, you're at the center and the audience is laughing at you. The actors are targeting you. So that is a, a moment of real fear, unlike what one usually gets in, in, uh, in poor films when, again, you're pretty sure that nothing is going to happen and uh, the film is just going to unfold like it has a thousand times before. So the, the real horror of, of uh, uh, theater performances can be quite different from what we see in, in horror films generally. Uh, I, I will say, not that it's Evil Dead, but it is horror uh, theater related. I remember going to a dinner theater and seeing a, a, a live version of Little Shop of Horrors. Mm. And that was an interesting one because... You know, they served us a meal, and then we went to see the stage production. And they did a very interesting thing at the end of the play where they dropped vines out of the rafters. 
of this old mm. building that had been converted to a theater, and the whole audience just screamed in terror, right? I mean, something that was kind of somewhat terror, but but more comedic. But that was an, an interesting way to end that. And that's, I think, the thrill of the live performance, right, is mm -hmm. there's a script, but it's live. So you're you're always in that state, and the audience is much more of an essential component mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, a, in a live theatrical performance. You know, if you're in the theater... There's a little bit of distance, you and the screen, you and the you and the and the film. Even if you're watching it at home, uh, it might be a little unnerving, but still, but that that liveness is is very essential, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, I just went to see the new Halloween in uh in, uh, in the theater. I was I had I was zero percent scared. I mean, just nothing about that film scared me at all. Oh, is is, is Helen there? Yes. Oh, I guess not. Can you hear me oh, now? Oh, she is. Oh, cool. Cool. Okay, good. Oh, good, great. Good. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, oh, but wait, wait, one thing I was going to add, too, because Andre's really got this thing going. We're talking about theatricality and fear. But um, uh, but one of the cool things, I'm, I'm really, really, really tall. So I get asked, I, like, I, I'm actually in an upcoming horror movie. I'm playing, like, the, the main role. It's called Flesher. I get asked to be in stuff, and like I, I've been asked in the past to be in haunted houses because um, they're like, "Oh my God, you scare people!" And so they they like to make me in the I don't know, just the demons and Frankenstein and that kind of thing. But one of the cool things I was working this haunted house and I was popping out at people, and my height would fear that and make them scream sometimes. But one of one of the things I did because you're almost experimenting because you're just doing this over and over and over and over again to people, and I did this one thing where I got up on top. Uh, in the rafters, and then with my long hands, I would reach down, and all I would do is just like very lightly just brush the top of their head, and then I'd pull my arm up so they they would look up and not be able to see what happened, and I got some intense screams from that, and it was all it is is basically is just very, I mean sometimes I'm not even touching them; it's just the movement of my hand creating a wind that then moves their hair. And I used to get some huge screams, and I I was really interested in that about. The subtleties of, of what can make, especially some subtle, subtleties of, I don't know, feeling something, where, where, and then not knowing where it came from. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I remember I'd watch people in the dark, and, I, and they would just be terrified. Like, and then they'd be explaining to a friend of somebody touched me, and then like nobody's around right now. <laughs> They're like, no, somebody touched me. <laughs> you know, and even if I hadn't, like I said, it's just my hand moving, and then and then they could feel it on their hair. Um, I was really interested in that, but why that why that terrifies so much. Um, I don't know if anybody if it fits in with the stage reality thing, but it's it's improv. <laughs> that was definitely improv when I did that. <laughs> well, that's the part of the the reality of uh, of the stage where you know people are there in connection with with objects and with actors and with if you expect someone in front of you, well, that's fine. But if the the, the movement comes from behind or if someone touches your hair, then it's terrifying again because it's, it's actually real uh, it might not be a threat if it's just this soft touch but it's something you're not expecting and it's not within the confines of a film when you know that the film can never touch you except of course if there's actors in the audience as sometimes happens that's quite rare usually when you go see again you were talking about uh, Halloween the new Halloween which is not scary at all and I agree with you completely uh, but it's totally behind in the confine of the screen, so nothing can actually happen. Um, so even a scary horror film remains totally safe because nothing can touch you. While in in an environment like a, a fun house or in a theater where the actors can actually touch you, um, that can be a bit more uh, unnerving because again we're we're within the the reality, the presence of um, both the spectator and uh, the actor in the same space at the same time. So there's always an element of real fear that cinema cannot quite create. Stefan, I know with yeah. your segment in the book, you were talking about uh, the franchise, franchise fright between the film to the game, because I do also believe that the film came out before the game. So what yes. what can you tell us about uh, either dif differences or what were the certain changes or similarities? What what the uh, your section about? 
Well, I think that, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about the Evil Dead franchise is that it's a, it's a real transmedia property. I mean, we've got the films, we had the TV series, we've got video games, we've got the stage musical. Um, it really goes across a lot of different uh, media. And there was, back in 1984, so not too many years after the first film, there was an Evil Dead game released for the Commodore 64. It wasn't very good. Uh, you know, I mean, it was, it, it tried, uh, given, given the time. So really, there, there wasn't a, a run at the franchise again until 2000. And a video game developer and publisher called THQ, they got the rights to do an adaptation. And so they came out with basically three games, uh, Hail to the King, A Fistful to Boomstick, and then Regeneration. And they decided with these to basically sort of continue the um, uh, the narrative of uh, what we saw uh, ending basically with Army of Darkness and the theatrical ending of the film, not the unused alternate that's provided on home video. And uh, basically, you know, Ash is kind of back where he belongs, things are seemingly returned to normal. He has a little bit of PTSD uh, from his experiences about everything, and basically the cycle begins anew. So they bring in elements from the movies like Ash's Severed Hand, uh, uh, Professor Noby's Incantation Tape, and uh, Evil Ash shows up, that sort of thing. And basically they use those filmic elements to create a new sort of narrative continuity. Impressive. Now, I'm kind of familiar with a little bit of regeneration, or unless mm -hmm. I'm getting it confused with maybe Hail from the King. But, um, I mean, I remember when I was younger anyway, I played one of those games and i just remember slicing and dicing through with the uh chainsaw hand so it was all it was always fun i don't really remember if i really could get into the story but it was like um pc day but it's it's always cool to see what game uh studios can kind of come up with to either continue a story or maybe do a spin-off, kind of like with the whole um, Ash versus the Evil Dead TV show that we got for like three yeah. seasons, and which I think Bruce Camp Campbell said something about like these three seasons could have easily been like um, oh god, like twenty films or something. I can't, I don't exactly remember what how many he said, but it's just, it's always that cool idea though of when when it's effective anyway and successful when they turn a film into a video game yeah these were these were pretty i would say they were pretty decent adaptations a lot of film to game translations suffer from rushed development and just kind of or another game is being developed and they graft the ip from the film onto an existing project and it's it's not really well thought out I think a lot of people really like Ash as a protagonist, and so the ability to now play him uh, rather than just watch him go through the stuff is very satisfying uh, for a lot of people. And, and since Bruce Campbell does all the voice work, you get him really inhabiting the character. I saw him speak, uh, it must have been around 2000 or 2001, and Hail to the King had just come out, and somebody said, "Are you know, are you going to do any more Evil Dead movies?" And he said, "Well, at this point, you know, I'd like to do more, but we don't really have any in the pipeline. But for those of you who want another, if you're longing for another movie, go buy this game and play it, because that's going to give you a somewhat cinematic experience, right? It's going to extend the story, and uh, you know, I think in a lot of ways." keep the interest in the franchise alive. Oh yeah, for sure. And 
I think Hail to the King, um, I might have to actually quickly look it up, but I want to say Hail to the King actually did was more the bestseller, I believe, compared to the other two. Unless I'm getting it mixed up with maybe uh, Regeneration. Regeneration did pretty well also. Um, that one, uh, they brought in... Uh, I, I guess more of the as they went along, the series they kind of opened up more with that playful sort of humor uh, that we got used to in uh, Evil Dead, um, and kind of that brand of horror comedy or comedic horror, however you want to go. Plus, by that point, um, Hail to the King had come out on. Uh, PlayStation, Windows, and Dreamcast, of all things. And then they, THQ, by the time they did Fistful of Boomstick and Regeneration, we were into the PlayStation 2, Xbox era. So um, both of those appeared on PlayStation 2 and Xbox. And then Regeneration was back on Windows as well. So they only didn't put Fistful of Boomstick on to PC for, you know, whatever reason. Hmm. Yeah, I I could only imagine why they didn't because PC is usually one of the most popular platform to play on, and it's, it's I I guess it just whatever maybe they just couldn't get the uh, the design well not design um what do I want to say. Well, maybe it is in a way like the design where, you know, they had to code everything, really. They had to get the coding right. Maybe the coding wasn't adding up or maybe they figured keyboard and mouse just wasn't a great idea. Um, yeah, my, I don't know. my guess is that they were probably designing for console first at that point, And then the decision to port it to PC was probably like, yeah, let's not do it or we've run out of time, whereas by the time Regeneration comes out um, in, in 2005, those consoles have been well-established, and putting it, making sure that a Windows version uh, got released would, would definitely help with sales. Oh, yeah, for sure. I am... Um... Whatever really helped for sales, it's just, you know, one of those things where it's who's going to take the bite, as I may say. Like, and what I mean by that is which one is really going to shine, shine and make it more of a awareness, if, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense, I would say. But I don't know. I mean, it's just interesting. And I mean, at least we got these three interesting games uh, it's just uh i am and i mean i guess uh let's see so yeah so hail to the king is eight years after the events of the army of darkness mm -hmm. and then i i guess um oh a fistful of boomstick is taken right after the game hail to the king for sure mm -hmm. Which, I guess, yeah, a fistful about of the starts three, story. about three, three, three years in the narrative universe after Hail to the King. So, uh -huh. yeah, and then it's talking about the battle between the ne uh, the Necrom oh geez, um, Necronomicon and the Ex Mortis, and I think it was also about the flashbacks, I believe. Yes. Yeah, they they this one that was a time traveling adventure. So Ash goes to uh, a number of different time periods um, in, in and around Dearborn. Right, he's sort of stuck in Dearborn as a locus of what's going on. So he's there in the 17th century. He's there in the 19th century. Um, he gets to interact with with one of his distant ancestors, who's a blacksmith, and um, they really have fun in the level design by using the time travel conceit. 
they can actually really create some very different levels. And I think that's one of the things that was very intriguing with the end of Evil Dead 2, after Ash gets sucked through the portal and he lands, you know, back, uh, back in the past. And I remember watching that going, oh, I, where's the next movie? Like, when, as soon as the film ended, I wanted the next one. Right, because I really wanted to see where the story was going. So, um, anytime I think a lot of times when you have time travel, it's people get really interested in the in the possibilities of that. Uh, now, regeneration started a completely new narrative from uh, Hail to the King and Fistful of Boomstick. THQ kind of switched developers, and uh, they wanted to again sort of kind of reboot the story. And that's, you know, an interesting thing that you can do with a transmedia property is that you don't necessarily have to say this is canonical, this is non-canonical. Um, some properties that are well-established like Star Wars or Star Trek, you know, really the property owners really want to say what's the legit part of the story and what isn't. But I think with the Evil Dead stuff, they're just more willing to take different runs at the character and it all kind of exists separately but you know linked by the source material but really each sort of thing is its own individual creation like the evil dead comic books you know very much their own sort of story even though they reference the films well i think they kind of have to just to kind of give it either that nod or at least some type of clue maybe as if this is like a different uh, another timeline compared mm -hmm. to or something like like to to uh, to uh to touch on what you have mentioned about uh regeneration yes it did take the alternate reality and it also not only did it send us back to the end of Evil Dead 2, but it would, uh, I guess, the continuation or something about what happened if Ash didn't have, like, a time travel thing. Or... Right. So, I guess that's the only other difference, really, between the other two games. It's just that this is mainly just trying to say, like, well, hey, this is what it's, it could have happened if if it were to continue right after the end of Evil Dead 2, which yeah. probably led up to Army of Darkness, maybe. it's I don't really know that answer. Well, they kind of go, it goes on its own thing. But that's the beauty. I mean, I think that's the wonderful thing of, of the Evil Dead, is it invites all of these people to play within the narrative universe. Uh, that Sam Raimi has set up and it's like everything is equally good and fun and interesting so you know let's put it in a musical let's put it in a comic book let's put it in a TV show let's put it in a video game and see what each medium brings to the evil dead as it goes through these various translations that is true and I'm not real too familiar with the comics either. I know there's like quite a few different ones as well, as you were kind of mentioning with with their stories a little bit. And, but I mean, that's I think that's what I like about between films and games, where you know you can have that that open mind of this is what we can do in this universe as long as we kind of stay true to the original roots. So. It's uh, it's always cool to see what we can actually do to make more of a entertainment for us and want to have more. Yes. Now, Ron, now, just out of curiosity, I, f I didn't see this the first time when we were uh, talking first, but, at a, uh, but did you notice there was a prequel, I guess? With that starred Bruce Campbell and Ellen, um, what is that? For uh, who is that? It's Ellen Sandwich, I think. Who is that? Ellen Sandwich or something like that. It's called like Within the Woods. I guess it's the Evil Dead prequel. I didn't know if you. Yeah, we, 
Yeah, it's written throughout throughout the book. Um, in 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 my essay, I, I really talk about. I, I was interested in how. Actually, I didn't know the answer to this. I, I I wanted to see if like sort of Sam Raimi started the horror film genre in Michigan, basically. Um, so I I just researched and I looked to find out all the films that were shot in Michigan, and I listed them for anybody who's like a Michigan horror film buff. Uh, it's in the book, but uh. It was interesting. Is in 1946 was the very first film that was ever shot in Michigan. It was a Spiral Staircase that was uh, had a horror in the horror genre, and um, it was until 1970 till another one got done. It was Night of the Bloody Transplant. Then in 1977, you get Deathbed, the Bed That Eats, and Demon Lover. But in 1981, it is it is Evil Dead, and then uh, 87, Evil Dead Two, and then by the time Army of Darkness comes out. We have a the Michigan film industry has sort of been set up, and I've talked to the Michigan Film Board about about how how does how does this, how do films get shot in a city? And he said the best thing if you want to have a film industry in your city is shoot a film there because now you're establishing crew, equipment, all that sort of thing. And he said the more that you start doing it, the more you start get all those things in place, all that networking in place. And <coughs> Sam Raimi really set that up in Michigan, where now it's like constantly we have horror films that are filmed in the state and that actually takes in a lot of money uh it's helpful for communities when you're when you're having films that get shot there and so yeah he started with these little shorts um and it's right around around the time when you know the, the like i said the, the 77-ish you know the, the early 80s he, he's, ex he's just experimenting with horror and in in if uh, Chins, Chins could kill bruce camel's book he talks a lot about how why they went into horror and it's, it's the si similar things that we're talking about with the stage where Andre was talking about how you can put evil, evil dead up on the stage and almost do it for nothing. Uh, it was something that they could do really, really cheap, but they also found that there could be an audience with it. And the cool thing has been, it's created like this whole interest, uh, really passion for horror within the state of Michigan. Uh, so I'm kind of interested in actually looking at that in some other states too, of like what, what triggers horror to become, to explode in certain areas, because there, there are certain parts of the United States that we just <laughs> sort of equate with horror. In, in Michigan, I know that there's a really big uh, horror film base. Um, uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah, so. yeah Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, too, Zom actually. Zom I, I, zombie yes, capital definitely. of the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Yeah, I was just curious, because I, did, I actually didn't know um, there was a <clears throat> short film that was a prequel for it, so that's actually new to me. So, huh, interesting. Um, I have no idea if it's still available somewhere, but I'll try to see if I can find oh, it. Oh, sure, if you, if you hunt around, it's probably on YouTube. But Night of the Living Dead is the reason why we're talking about Pennsylvania. I mean, and I do think it is, you know, someone like George Romero, it's somebody who just steps up, does does horror, does it well, and then people go, oh, my God, I want to do that. Especially, it, it really motivates people from that area. For me, it's it's. I'm a Michigan guy, so when I'm when I'm seeing the monstrous success of someone like Sam Raimi, it just makes me really interested in the genre, especially because I'm I'm coming from like mining town where there's like a, not a lot of success, not a lot, there's a lot of poverty, you know, a lot of unemployment. But to have somebody who just explodes in the entertainment industry, it's really inspirational. So so you do in in the book, you're gonna see it. There's just next. There's a long list of films that are just consistently getting shot there now, and I do think it's because of specifically Sam Raimi. Hmm. Well, definitely when I um, get a copy, some like hopefully in the next couple of weeks or so, um, my job finally started to kick in through overtime. So I just need to just catch up on some bills and then I'll probably get your book here that we're talking about the many lives of the evil dead just so i can actually really skim through it or maybe what i can just do to hold me until i get a hard copy is just get the kendall edition but um it's just so go to the library you can have your library order it for you and by the way uh within the woods it's on youtube you can watch it on youtube Sweet. i'll definitely have to watch it after later on tonight but um I know, Ron, we kind of talked to you about how you got into this. So I'm curious about uh, Andre here. You're you're actually, unless you aren't anymore, but um, 
uh, I was learning that you were a professor for the uh, film studies at the St. Thompson or Thomas uh, University. Thomas University. Yeah, yeah, I'm a film prof. I'm, I, I spend most of my time actually being a, a dean of humanities, so I do a lot of, of bureaucratic stuff, but when I have time, I, I teach film, and uh, I, I have two specialties. One is, is um, Canadian stuff, and the other one is uh, horror, so something like, even if Evil Dead is not Canadian, although Michigan is almost a part of Canada, um, but uh, the play <laughs> was, was started in, in Kingston, Ontario, so that's what uh, I had an interest, of course, in, in Evil Dead, but I became um, increasingly interested in the play itself because of its sort of Canadian roots, and it goes back to perhaps what Ron was saying. There's just places where you don't expect things like horror films or horror plays to be produced, and all of a sudden they, they emerge and they create uh, uh, an interest or a fascination in that uh, environment, uh, and it, it starts uh, sort of snowballing where people become interested and they realize, okay, we can stage a play and it's not going to cost a lot of money. Uh, and I think that it's really the uh, the reason why um, Evil Dead, the musical, eventually became a success. It took a while, but it eventually became a success because it was it could be done cheaply. People saw that it was fun, and they, of course, there's such a following for Evil Dead that there was sort of a, an audience waiting for a, for a musical. But I think that in great part, it's it's because of the uh, the small production value, and that anyone can put the play on and have an audience and before you know it word of mouth turns it into a, turns it into a, a hit so so that was sort of my interest in the play itself was actually its emergence from um, Kingston Ontario so out of nowhere no one knows where Kingston Ontario is well I do but most people don't and and that was sort of part of this idea of uh, creating a play on the basis of a film that was also not out of Hollywood, that was a small film uh, out of Michigan, that then all of a sudden became this, this phenomenon. So there's definitely something to say for those uh, little pockets of uh, horror creativity that come out of nowhere, and of course we refer to Pittsburgh and George Romero, uh, and that in and of itself is quite fascinating, and that's what first got me interested in, in the play itself. Wow. <laughs> that's really impressive, and I am kind of glad that you found something that you enjoy and well i shouldn't say kind of glad i am glad for you i mean it's always good that we all can find something that we like to do rather than just go ugh not this again is it over yet yeah. <laughs> like yeah. so but it's um out of curiosity too like before you became a professor to teach this would you say that um, Evil Dead might have had some type of inspiration or did something else really kind of catch you to go like, you know, this would be kind of cool to make as a play or do you have like a favorite play that kind of just made you go, man, I really like this and I like how they uh, pulled it off and maybe I could like, you know, create one of my own or how did that actually kind of come to be? It's, uh, it's a good question. Well, definitely Evil Dead. I remember seeing it on video. I don't think I saw it in the theaters when it first came out. Um, I'm not sure that it made it to wherever I lived in Canada at that point, but I remember seeing it on, on video, and that was quite uh, a memorable uh, experience um, because the well, because of the film itself, but also because of the audience. I saw it on, on video, so it was not a theater audience, but it was um, in um, in a residence, in a university residence with a bunch of guys and we're all drunk. And uh, to this day, I think that's probably the best way to watch um, the original Evil, De Evil Dead, uh, to, <laughs> to have had some sort of um, social lubricant that puts you into the frame of mind that, uh, that the film is, is really all about. So, uh, and I remember vividly finding it um, unsettling and extremely uh, amusing. And later I read about um, Philip Brophy's term, horality, but it really resonated with me, this sense of, of laughing, screaming, and being very unsettled, but really enjoying it. Uh, and that's one, one of the things that I first discovered with Evil Dead, and that's definitely something that encouraged me to continue to study film and theater and to become a professor eventually. 
Um, so I'm not sure that Evil Dead was the only reason, probably wasn't, but it was definitely one of those moments when, uh, as a younger man, I realized that film could could be much more than just a, a story. Or well, I always liked horror films, so I've seen I had seen tons of horror films before, but the experience of watching Evil Dead and the and the group of us and all laughing and screaming at the same time, so that that actually is uh, a way of an understanding film which is quite different from the traditional sort of you sit there in the dark in silence and you let the film do everything as opposed to contributing to the film with members of the audience screaming at the at the screen uh, and the screen and really engaging in the sort of interaction uh, Stefan was talking about games and I think that the film itself has this quality of being almost an interactive game because you 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 talk to the film, you laugh with the film, you scream with the film. Um, and again, watching Evil Dead for the first time, must have been around 1983, 84, maybe something like that. Um, that's really when I started to understand what film can do to you when you decide to break out of this sort of conventional relationship of the silent spectator just looking at the film and the film does everything. Um, and that got me also interested in theater because that's also what happens in theater where the audience has a much larger role to play. Um, going back to Ron's uh, anecdote earlier on where the actors can actually start chasing you out of the theater. Um, none of this happens in uh, your conventional uh, cinema viewing experience. Very impressive. Now, when you're teaching, is there like any type of I'm trying to figure out how I'm how I can word this like like when you're teaching is there like any type of important oh um oh god like I guess what I'm trying to say is when you're trying to teach your students either to create a the like I don't know if you create backdrop or create the the props or maybe the costume but What's usually one of the most important things that you tell your class, like, this is, like, I don't know, like, this is the important thing, and how do they react to it, I guess, to help them improve, and if not, try to learn different different techniques of their own or something? Yeah, well, yeah, there's a, a lot of things that um, we we talk about um, and I think that the, in, in a nutshell what I encourage them to, to do is to be uh, as creative as they can with the with um, a minimum of um, of pyrotechnics if you will trying to get the effect in as, as simple a way as, uh, as possible um, so that because again not everyone can make films in Hollywood so you start you have to start small um, and but there's a way of making uh, very scary films or very scary um, stage plays that can be achieved with again minimal costs, where it's more imagination than than anything else. Uh, and I'm thinking, for instance, of the short film that I'm sure everyone has seen, um, um, Lights Out, a little two-minute film that's made with no money at all, and it, it works very, very well. So I do show that to my students, um, that you can make a film that is quite scary um, and that works quite well, and only with two minutes and basically minimal investment. Um, and I also refer to the fact that they tried to make Lights Out as a feature film. They did, and it turned out to be not particularly successful um, because, again, I have the impression that uh, there was too much, too many resources there and they got lost in the, in the pyrotechnics and the special effects as opposed to sticking to the essence of what works to scare the audience. Um, I know that uh, um, Heron's, Heron Shin's article is on the affect and, and this, the importance of creating this affect uh, in using uh, the the medium, either film or theater, intelligently and efficiently without having to rely on very, very expensive um, special effects, which sometimes work, okay, fine, but very often they're, they're more uh, an obstacle to the real affect of horror than, uh, than just, again, very creative. And that's, and Sam Raimi was, had this sense of how to create 
uh, film out of nothing. I don't know that Ron probably knows the exact budget for the original Evil Dead. I don't know. But it's obviously not a film that has a huge budget and yet so so efficient in creating this experience for spectators, as I was talking about earlier when I saw it the first time. It's an experience like I had never um, had before. And again, it's done with uh, minimal um, resources. Uh, and that's the one thing, perhaps, that I try to uh, to, to teach the, the students. Well, I t- try to teach them many things, but in terms of if they want to produce films or plays, the one thing that I uh, tell them to do is to try to use their imagination and not let a small budget stop them, because there's so many great examples, including Evil Dead, of films with minimal budgets that really manage to you know, create this phenomenon that we're talking about today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't really need a budget just to create something effective, just like, as you mentioned, like out the short, which is very effective. And I will say that's a little bit more scarier than definitely the full the full feature length, for sure. I also thought that they tried to make it more of a scare factor than what you were talking about as well. Yeah. but. I just think because of the fact that they really tried to make it the scares scary, I think that's also where they lost the touch rather than yeah. the simple thing as the short did, where mm-hmm. it it is kind of scary to, you know, uh, turn off the light to see something standing there just to turn on and it is closer. And it, mm-hmm. I think that's just more effective. And as for the budget for Evil Dead, I'm... Um, Actually, I don't know if Ron even had the uh, the info, but I'm definitely don't see a a budget anywhere. The budget it's three three hundred fifty thousand dollars a cost, but it made then two point five million. Um, <laughs> good investment. Yeah. Oh yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there it is. Now I find the budget. Yeah, of course. Jeez, um, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's pretty effective, and I mean, I. What are your? I'm just curious of your guys' thoughts on today's horror films, like with the budget being really high, and then they complain that they can't make their money back. Now, is that because they may have spent the funds in like a, uh, and a I don't really I I I almost want to say like in a waste way like in a wasting way where maybe they're trying to rely more on the CGI or or maybe there's not enough practical effects because they're try or they're not a they're, they're practical effects but it's not an like enough to really give out a really good story. I'm just curious what you guys your thoughts on horror nowadays. Actually, can it, is Helen still there? Helen is not. Oh, she she dropped. Yeah, she it looked like she dropped out. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because I was want, I was wanting to get her. I don't know input, but uh, can you say the question one more time? Um, I'm oh. just I'm just curious on what you guys' just thoughts are with the whole f- horror movies being made nowadays that have like a. Uh, higher budget than normal where do they like um you know some films may uh gotta use like almost a hundred million dollars or something and then they eat i don't want to say complain but you know they they sink their money so much money into the film and then it doesn't really get it all back now do you think that's because they are relying or using it on the wrong things, like maybe too much practical effect, not enough uh, story element to really fit like a location. Because I know how some places they charge a specific fee to maybe like shoot there and stuff. But or do you think maybe there's way too much CGI that kind of takes the people out of it? I mean, I can definitely chime in on that. I think that the, the pro- one of the main problems with Hollywood is that there's just not enough risk taking. I mean, I, I am so incredibly sick of these uh, superhero films. I'm just so overdosed on them. They just, you know, and, and that's what they do is they try to get something that 
they think is going to get a big audience and they go with it. And then the problem is too, is there's a lot of piracy and there's a lot of people not, not going to the theater. So they have to create movies that they feel like people are going to want to go to the theater to see. And a lot of times that turns into quickly in a spectacle. Uh, I, I, I love these films like the evil dead night of the living dead that we're talking about were at the time. I mean, night of the living dead. I can't imagine if, if I was, if, if, you know, was it 1968? If I'm going to the theater and seeing that in 1968, that thing would have just blew me away. Same thing with Evil Dead. I mean, the first time I saw Evil Dead 2, I was just like, the scene where he's <laughs> breaking into just this little hysterics, laughing with the furniture in the room. I'm like, that is inventive. I've never seen anything like it. It was just so, it was such a great portrayal of madness to me. And, and I just find that a lot of these films nowadays are copycat films. And so I lose interest in that regard. But I'd love to hear what Andre and Stefan think about that, too, if they can chime in on that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think that, that uh, okay. the, there is a, this, there, there are formulas in Hollywood, and everybody falls back on the formulas and, and just tries to to get their their money back and and usually as we were saying earlier what matters most is imagination and creativity and uh, mm -hmm. and, and again uh, of course I didn't I didn't see um, Night of the Living Dead in 1968 I was way too young by then but you can imagine that the shock that this would have caused um, to audiences that would have seen this back then again because it's again very very cheaply made uh, but there's just a sense of creativity and risk taking as Ron was saying let's just try something different and it still it still happens uh, there's Things like, um, well, I'm just thinking of Get Out, for instance, which I thought yes. might not be the scariest film ever made. It might barely qualify as a horror film, but incredibly imaginative and creative and risk-taking and really trying to do something different within the within the genre. So it, it still happens. But, but, but that, and, and, and also, there was a lot of things in Get, Get Out, like I've already seen this shot before. Uh, there is some... I mean, it's great to have the, uh, that black perspective, but so much of that movie was kind of copycat. And, and even yep. uh, uh, um, uh, the, the director had said that. He said he, he specifically mm -hmm. was trying to pay homage to his previous movies where I did. There were some times it was like, I've already seen this scene before. So that's why mm -hmm. I'm, I haven't seen Us yet, and I think it's a great title. <laughs> and it, it has this like, connotation of U.S., which I'm, I'm interested mm -hmm. to see because I have seen that's part of the commentary. But I'm hoping he's going to go in a much more, I don't know, sort of imaginative route with it. I just saw the opening to Twilight Zone, the new one, and I, and again, it was something where I was like, it's 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 not inventive enough. I've already seen. I feel like I've already seen this before. So, and I, want I to think ask you'll you, Andre, is, you go ahead. I I, I I think you'll enjoy us because Jordan mm -hmm. Peele said, you know, I made Get Out as a horror film, but people didn't know what to do with it genre wise so i've made us as a pure horror film now mm -hmm. that's there what is I'm social for, there, yeah. there is social commentary to it but it is much more of a horror film than get out was although i i really enjoyed get out i thought it was really good i just watched I it was the episode of yeah. twilight zone last night which to me is a disappointment through and through peel yeah that's just what i'm feeling too He's just attached to it as an executive producer, and you know mm -hmm. he's doing the the Rod Serling bit. But I don't know. That's 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 kind of that's kind of bothersome. I mean, I think what both of you've been saying about the importance of imagination, right? And we could have a big budget. We could throw fifty million dollars at a horror film. You know, you see someone get eviscerated by Leatherface, and they do it again and again and again. I mean, how many times do you see someone get flayed alive? And there you exactly. go. So it, it's it's those films that get into your imagination that stick with you. I don't if, if it's psychological or it just engages the imagination. So Evil Dead Two, I saw you know when I saw that on home video, I was like, this is amazing. Like, where's the next film? <laughs> There's a film before this because I I saw two without having seen one. So I went and tracked down one, and I was very confused about what in the hell was going on with the plot, but. I, it's it's not really. I don't think it, it it if you have a low budget production, quote unquote, you are forced to do creative things. You're forced to think exactly. outside the box, mm -hmm. and 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 for new filmmakers, that's 
liberating, I think, in a sense. Well, I wanted to do this shot where this person gets split open all these different ways, but we don't have the budget for it. So how can I still, you know, give a give a sense of horror to an audience? Let the imagination take over, right? Let the imagination do the heavy lifting, and you're going to make a great film. Is Helen on the line yet? Yes. Can you no? hear me? Have, oh, oh, you, oh, oh okay. good. Helen, oh, yeah, if you wanted to join in with this. Yeah. Sure. Huh? So the topic we're talking about is, or, or do you already know? Oh, yes. Um, I've been listening in since um, you moved on okay, from good. Get Out to Us. Yes. <laughs> Well, any thoughts on what we're talking about is like these big budget horror films that don't actually, you know, work. And then how, how you know, what films do you think actually do, you know, work right. in terms of how, scaring? Sure, sure. I, I agree about Get Out. It was really well executed. And I also agree about the opening of Twilight Zone because I was still looking forward to it. And then it was the recapping and a lot of familiar things, not really opening up the imagination as just mentioned, but uh, I did see Us, and Us, I can't see how Jordan Peele was really getting to the pure horror and experience of it. I also think the plot elements are rather confusing, and maybe he was trying to do too much in a limited, uh, over a limited span of time, but um, yeah, I, I was impressed by the way in which he executed some of the key tropes, so, but um, I, I I haven't had a chance to watch um, Pet Cemetery yet, but the trailer was disappointing, and I think it aligns with what you were all saying about how it's exciting to have a big budget and a lot of possibilities coming out of it, but perhaps it's necessary to go back to the pure experience of horror as a nitty-gritty, more affective force that really hits you and sweeps you away instead of trying to create some awesome effects or do something scale-wise. So, yeah, I'm hoping we see some more of that really tightly knit and effectively impactful horror. Yeah. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. I haven't had a chance to see us yet or um, Pet Cemetery myself, but when I first was watching the us trailer i kind of was a little bit disappointed just because it reminded me of that one episode from the original like twilight zone and i'm just like man i think we've already seen it before so do i really kind of need to see it again so i don't know i don't know maybe i'll well, still jordan give it a peele, shot jordan peele did say he was inspired by that episode of the twilight zone he's he's he doesn't hide it at all um, but what, what I've been doing, I've actually been going back and rewatching all of Key and Peele. And uh -huh. Jordan, Jordan Peele is obsessed with horror. If you right. go back and watch all those Key and Peele episodes, there are so many of them that the, the humor is tinged with the horrific, right? And, and this is what I think is the kind of the genius of the Evil Dead is, Within horror, there is something that is maybe somewhat comedic, or you need a laugh, you need an outlet. Uh, you know, you get pushed to something, it becomes so zany. Uh, you're getting chased by a guy wearing another person's face, <laughs> running around with a chainsaw. And, and if, you, if you stop to think about it in a rational sense, you're like, this is silly as hell. But when someone is running behind you with a chainsaw, you're not thinking that, right? And and as a viewer, you're you're kind of in this very p sort of peculiar place. Uh, uh, you, you, you know what's you know what's interesting to find is I I, I I agree with a a lot of what you just said. I just, I, think, I think it's really pretty smart. It, but uh, when I go to horse or I mean, not when I go to horses, when I go to comedy shows, I do find a lot of times that they are operating on. They're touching on the horrific a lot. Yes, um, yes. I find that, it's, it's especially when I go to comedy clubs, much, much more than stuff yes. I'm going to see on television. Because for television, they're going to they're going to uh, just make everything lukewarm. But what, when I've been when I, and I go to comedy shows a lot, and and, and uh, I do notice that the same things that are are shocking, 
horrific in their in their, their in in a lot of ways it is almost <laughs> flirting with the horror genre so that's that's a really mm-hmm. interesting point that you're making because I, I have found that where, I, where, where we it's almost like what are the the most terrifying things about life now let's start talking about that i was just watching this clip of uh, a show of maria bamford and she was doing talking about in sort of some ways that scene we're talking about the evil dead where bruce campbell's just laughing hysterically with the furniture of, of like madness mm-hmm. she was in, in doing it really um in, in a way of just having almost like having fun with things like uh, suicide and stuff like that and it was it was pretty intense and now that I, I'm having this conversation, it's putting that in a really different light last night because I found myself laughing at some things that were exceptionally dark and the cathar- you know, how cathartic it is to do that, how purgative it is to do that. So, yeah, it's an interesting point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting point. And, I mean, I do I do applaud that Jordan Peele got a, an Academy Award. I think he definitely deserved it, especially when it comes to horror, because a lot of people nowadays get screwed on, like, Academy Awards, and they don't get the recognition that a lot of good actors deserve. And I just think it's just, one, it's a, an a shame, uh, it's a shame to have to, you know... <sighs> you get you get nominated or something or you know and you you do so good and then you just get i don't know you just don't get the recognition that you don't that you get deserve so i don't know kind of weird what one weird thing is that uh, is for me is i, I don't know <laughs> it's like but i'm in the the film industry i guess you would say and i i know i know you know uh, Dennis Widmeyer, who directed Pet Cemetery. I know very well Kumail Nanjiani, uh, who's in you know the Twilight Zone. Uh, I, I've hung out. I, I, I've seen Jordan Peele quite a bit, but the Keegan Michael Key, I've hung out with him, and it's weird for me to be just, just, just discussing these things when I I know their backgrounds. I mean, the cool thing is people like Kumail Nanjiani. Keegan Michael Key, they're exceptionally nice people. Like Keegan Michael Key is one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. So it's kind of uh, interesting that I'm even having these conversations where I have that sort of like <laughs> intimate knowledge of them and then getting to see them explode. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I thought I'd add that in. It was just kind of surreal as I'm talking about it. I'm like, I'm slamming the Twilight Zone and I know Kamal, but he's, he's doing fine. So he's not, he's not, <laughs> not going to have a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and real quick, just to get back, since I know Helen hadn't shined in on it about the many lives of the Evil Dead. Now, um, Helen, you did a section in the book as well. Um, you were talking about the tracking gaze and the possessions perspective, which I'm assuming is like some of the stuff where it comes to like maybe the trees and how getting bitten transfers the. Uh, the possession, I guess I'll say. Can you talk uh, talk to us a little bit about what you talk about within that section? Sure. Um, well, I'm a huge fan, obviously, of Evil Dead. And to go back to what we were briefly talking about, how horror and uh, humor, comedy in particular, are so adjacent in their effective uh, effects, I, I was really uh, struck when I first saw that film um, by how the entire cast, and I'm not just talking about the human beings, uh, the actors and actresses, but also every object, every element of the film appear to be joining in on producing the effect of the quote-unquote evil. And evil itself appeared to be kind of a character in and of itself because of, just like you said, the trees or the movement of the camera, the squishing sound of the wind, and the dynamic interaction between all of them. So I was trying to get at that about how um, the cinematography and the make of the film itself um, as a mechanism unto itself was kind of a possessing force. And I, I often think um, the the effect of horror has so much to do with not just scaring people or um, upturning things or absurdity or conveying meaning, but something as a sheer experience. And in that sense, Evil Dead does such a wonderful job. It just pulls you in. It makes you ride the gaze of the evil and embody it and enact it and perform it in a way. So every time I rewatch it, it just 
sweeps me up and takes me on that ride. And um, I think that was one of the most powerful elements there, even the comedic moments, right? Because when you're part of that whole execution, you can really experience what's funny. Just like you said, um, having somebody chasing after you with a chainsaw, that experience is just so something that touches you down to the bone. And in order to be really part of it, I think the way in which the film is made is really important, not just the content or idea or plot. So, again, I was really drawn to the make of the film in that sense. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's just always fascinating. And, you know, always going back to it, it just amazes me of what they could actually get a, get away with back in the um, the 1980s. Well, um, actually, Ron, do you know um, when it actually started shooting? I forgot the original, the eighties. It was nineteen eighty. They've been talking about it. Yeah, in seventy nine, they're talking about it. But for, for, I remember it's it's really eighty. It was a long, exhausting shoot. I write about it in my essay too about how they're doing it in Tennessee, but they just don't have so much of it done. They run out of time. They run out of money. They're like, oh my yeah. God, we got to have finished film. Now we got to try figuring this out. I was so intrigued that the, there is no basement in Tennessee. There was no basement there. <laughs> they're, they're, that's all fake. It's They had to go back to Michigan and then use uh, basement in Marshall. Um, so that is, to me, is brilliant that they're just pretending that they're digging a hole, pretending that there's a basement underneath. That's that's low budget filmmaking. This is this was Stefan was talking about earlier. I love low budget filmmaking because it's the same with hip hop. I, I actually like it when they can't swear because now they got to come up with a different line. Some of my favorite Eminem lines are his his radio edit versions where he couldn't say the swear words, so he has to come up with something else. The other thing he comes up with is absolutely brilliant. So um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot in the movie that that's a bit like that. And the thing that I was interested to, to tie in with, with what, uh, what Helen was saying is that that opening shot of Within the Woods that you were talking about, you know, the, the early uh, Alan Sandwich one, is, is, is showing how he's, he's already immediately, even at that young, young age where I think he's a teenager, he's, he's interested in that camera movement and how that can suck you, pull you right into the, um, into the film, and that's and that shot is almost the exact same shot that we get in Evil Dead uh, that he's he's doing as the opening of Within the Woods. Yes, Raimi is a really really intelligent filmmaker. The way that he uses the camera to to pull you into the narrative. Oh yeah, and kind of like to shine on like what Betsy even was talking about when when we were talking with all you guys too. I remember when Betsy was saying we're even lucky to even have the Evil Dead today because of the fact that they ran out of money and stuff like that. Or yeah. Yeah. So and all the stuff that they had to go through and they didn't have trailers and stuff and Oh man, I mean, I applaud everybody that went through it and actually made it successful. So, and when they didn't think it was going to be uh, out and about, so we're pretty lucky. And um, to, sh to also not forget he uh, to sh for I can shine in too. Um, so. <clears throat> Helen, you're also a uh, professor as well, just like uh, Stefan as well, which I'll get back to, too. But, um, well, everybody's almost a professor here. <laughs> Maybe Ron is, too. I forget now. So I would be. The correct term for me is almost a professor. <laughs> almost. <okay. laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, Helen, you're actually a professor of English, cinema, and media arts. And you have like an Asian studios at um, Vanderbilt, I think, uh, University. That's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. Oh, um, no, not really. Uh, I, I'm at Vanderbilt, and actually, Vanderbilt is in Tennessee, since we were talking about Tennessee, Nashville. And uh, I am part of Asian studies as well. My primary department's in English, but I'm also affiliated with cinema, media arts, and Asian studies. So it's kind of like being in three departments yeah nice nice and going back to uh stefan real quick you're the yes. professor let me pull uh -huh. this up one more time again <clears throat> okay yeah you are the associate professor of the communication at high point university where you teach 
courses in game and interactive media design. Hmm. Um, now did, hmm, I don't want to say, did the Evil Dead inspire you to want to kind of take off into a career like that to teach of the game design in, or... Like what made like I guess what made you want to teach something like that? Because I mean, game design is always really cool, and interactive media design. Hmm. I'd like to hear I, more about this. Well, just I mean, in a in a very brief summary, um, you know, influential movies I saw growing up definitely Evil Dead Two. I'm going to throw Star Wars, Heavy Metal, Conan the Barbarian, Tron. I mean, I could go on and on, right? Highlander, right. um, all that sort of stuff. But for me, I've always been interested in narrative. I've always been interested in storytelling. So um, my teaching career, I started off as an English teacher. I did that for a number of years. And then I realized my students were watching more movies and reading less books. So I said, well, I love movies too. So let me learn more about filmmaking. And so I jumped to... Uh, uh, teaching film and I did that for a number of years but all along the way I kept playing video games I kept researching video games I kept writing about video games because there's a lot of crossover in the digital technologies that video game companies and now film companies use and then I just sort of slid into uh, uh, teaching game interactive media design um, but I think the whole, the whole time I've always been chasing the way that narrative is enacted through different media. And that's, again, one of the things that's really super cool about the Evil Dead franchise is that they've tried, you know, we've got the film, we've got the television show, we've got the musical, we've got the comic books, we've got the video games. I mean, they're really willing to take this property into a lot of different areas and that's always that's always very exciting when creators like to do that oh yeah for sure and just out of curiosity did you um did you yourself have learn or to create the uh the with, like you know the in-game game design or did you actually take any type of courses or online class or youtube videos or something to kind of learn how to go about game designing or did you i mean i yeah. took i took some courses but i don't know i'm the son of an engineer so we had a computer in the house from a very early age like back before computers were a common thing you know I convinced my parents to buy me an atari like, this is going to be huge, you know, you don't understand. And I was like 10 years old, you know, and, and very in, entranced by this new medium that had shown up. So uh, it, it's part of it's just a little bit of on the job training. Part of it's my own interests and what I picked up along the way. I mean, God, I remember learning HTML, you know, <laughs> nobody learns HTML anymore. You just, an editor does it for you, right? I mean, um, so in our game courses at High Point University, we use the Unreal Engine, which is done by Epic Games. Everybody probably knows about them because of Fortnite now. Fortnite's everywhere you turn around. They're here in North Carolina. They're over in the Research Triangle. I'm in the Triad. And um, we had a couple guys from Epic come to our, our game lab uh, a few months ago, and they were talking. And they said 50% of their business now is... Unreal Engine being used by Hollywood. So they made this game engine, but because of all the stuff you can do in it, it's now Hollywood is using it to create CGI and all this other cool stuff. So the two industries are converging, you know. That is true. That's true. And I mean, as much as I would rather prefer practical effects over CGI, but I completely understand when there is really ridiculously hard shots to make that you cannot do with practical effects, then I w would say, okay, CGI is the only answer. And, um, but then again, CGI to me is in a way a game design. I, it's kind of weird for me to say it like that. I probably, mm -hmm. but, um, but it, it kind of is, you're kind of doing, well, 
I wouldn't know for sure, but you're probably in the way creating CGI as you would like a game design as in a character background, whatever, really. Oh, absolutely. So. Level design, character design. I think I, I'm with you in that I think practical special effects are awesome. And I would never go 100% CGI in a film. I always want to see some practical effects. But if you're, you know, doing level design in the background, then it, it can really help do things. It's also a safety issue, too. You know, I mean, you can have a character get impaled and stabbed and shot and all these things, and you can use uh, digital effects for that so that the actor is never put in harm's way. Um, there's still something very nice about seeing someone really burning. You know, you know there's a stunt person in there uh, really on fire and... I don't know. The C as good as as good as the CGI gets, there still our eye still can you know kind of pick up the differences between the two. So, but we could have to to like loop back to something we were saying earlier. We could have the biggest best budget in the world for CGI, and if we have a crap script, you know, it's it's just not going to be good. And if we're relying too much on, as Ron was saying, spectacle to attract viewers rather than trying to tell a good story. Um, you know, our film is only going to be, but so successful. Oh yeah. I wanted to ask I, I wanted a really quick question. Andre, is there the same problems in Canada for Canadian yeah. horror and for Canadian film in general? Oh, it is. Yeah, there, there is, although it's not to the same extent as um, in, uh, in the States, obviously, because uh, even the big, budget in Canada is a relatively small budget uh, by uh, okay. Hollywood standards. So, but there, there is a, a sense that the, the, the better films are the ones that are actually still made with, uh, not necessarily a shoestring budget, but where the budget does not easily allow you to do whatever you want, so you have to come up with more imaginative ways, um, and that, uh, mm -hmm. that still is sort of the, the, uh, the dominant practice in Canada, but there is a a number of films, as a matter of fact, that are unrecognizably Canadian. Um, they're, they're, they really look like Hollywood films, and those tend to be the higher budget. And the only way you can tell them apart from, um, from Hollywood films is that they, they generally don't quite have the same quality as CGI, for instance. Um, so it's just a little bit cheaper, but they try to move in that direction, and those tend to be the, the films that that fail because on the one hand they lack the imagination of the smaller films and on the other hand they can't quite make it as big Hollywood blockbusters so they sort of sort of a lose-lose situation um, and definitely we have the same thing with a, with a guy like Cronenberg for instance in my view he made his best films when he had absolutely no money and now of course he doesn't really make yeah. horror it hasn't made horror in quite a while but it seems like the more money Cronenberg has uh, the less interesting his films are because he doesn't have to, he doesn't use ima his imagination the same way as he did with things like Shivers or The Brood, for instance, where he really had to, to make do with very small budgets, but those films in my view work a lot better than uh, his more recent stuff. But, uh, Andre, to <laughs> touch on what you were talking about with the, with the Canadian films, I, for some weird reason, I actually have a physical copy of a Canadian film called UKM, which is like the ultimate killing machine. Oh, and, boy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, it's very, um, I think I kept. I keep. I think I keep saying that that's a very interesting film. I don't really know how else to even tell anybody. It's just that if you can see it, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, yeah, interesting yeah. is one way of putting it. I yeah, guess. another yeah. cool movie that I've seen throughout Canada is uh, what is it called? Darken, and I know they did um, like a mini internet series for the the full length feature that they did and um then what was the other one i was just recently talking about it. Yeah. that one doesn't ring a bell the one you just mentioned darken doesn't darken i haven't seen it yeah. check out um check out darken provide.com to learn okay, all about it it. um and then the last one that i was recently talking about is called well everybody probably knows it now it's called the void and that was shot up in Canada. 
which yeah. I thought was very interesting. And um, another good practical effects film right there, right there, mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. really any CGI. If mm -hmm. with a little, I should say, actually. It's actually well, if we want to talk, if j just to mention, just to loop this back to Evil Dead uh, and specifically Sam Raimi, and we want to talk about budgets. So, you know, we get the Spider-Man trilogy, and then he does Drag Me to Hell, and then mm -hmm. the last film he directed was Oz the Great and Powerful, which was a huge budget, and I don't know about the rest of you, but kind of a hot CGI mess, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the, the, I think the last thing he directed, he did do uh, the El Jefe episode of Ash vs. the Evil Dead, right? So I, I think he may have realized that, you know, having a huge budget can work against you as a yeah. director. Mm -hmm. Except yeah, I think that example. made the most money of anything he's ever done, though, right? Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> There's, you know what? No one has written a book about the many lives of Oz the Great and Powerful. I can tell you that. Oh, I'm not. I'm not at all saying it's a good film. I'm just saying I think it made a lot of money. It, 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 in the in the in the reason why is like Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland is a piece of crap. It made a ton, and and it's because you're doing you're doing. Uh, it, it's just easy sell. It's Alice in Wonderland. It's the same thing with it's uh, you know. The Oz books, they just sell. So sadly, it's a bad movie, but it did really well uh, globally. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the oh, pain yeah. in the butt about the industry. <laughs> I guess the only thing I, I have left to ask real quick for you, Andre, is um, how were you approached to write a little essay for the book, The Money Lives of the Evil Dead? Uh, that's a good question. I have vague recollection that uh, there was a call out that uh, Ron sent mm -hmm. and uh, I responded to it um, primarily because I was already in interested in the play I wanted to write something on the musical and it was a happy coincidence that all of a sudden there was this call for contributions to a book on the evil dead so I just proposed something uh, at the time it was probably a very very brief abstract because I didn't really know where I'd be going um, but it was just a for me, a happy coincidence that I wanted to write on this musical, and lo and behold, there was uh, this project on on the on the franchise. So I uh, just submitted something, and uh, thank you, Ron. He accepted my proposal, and and the rest is uh, is now uh, in in a book that uh, that actually looks uh, very good. I I read uh, um, Helen Helen's uh, piece, and I was very uh, very impressed with the um, uh, especially the. The, the reference to how the camera embodies evil, I thought it was very uh, interesting. I still have to read uh, uh, Stefan's uh, article, but I'll get to it at some point. But I think that it, it looks like a very, very good, uh, very good collection from the few chapters that I've read so far, including mine, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> nice, very good, uh, Stefan. Is, is that kind of yes. like the same way with you? How you got involved with the book? Did Ron call you, or did somebody else call you? I saw the call for papers go out, and I was like, "Well, this is awesome because I'm, you know, I I, I love the Evil Dead, and I thought I I really haven't seen anyone write about the Evil Dead game." And uh, for people who are fans of the, you know, if you do like a Venn diagram of, you know, Evil Dead fans who've seen the movie, who's played the games, that's probably a much smaller sort of cross section. But I think that the horror genre, like science fiction, like fantasy, tends to get people who follow properties, right? So if you are a fan of Hellboy, the comics, you're going to go see the movie, you might play the game, you might watch the animated films, you know, you might buy the action figures, uh, you're going to go meet, you know, the actors at cons, that type of stuff. So some of these genres, really, the fandom is, is quite intriguing. So as both a fan and an academic, I said, this is a no-brainer, I got I to gotta throw a proposal Ron's way, and he accepted it, and the rest is now history. Yeah, one one of the things I did is I wanted to make sure it was people who are actually from places that are affiliated with the Evil Dead franchise. So I got uh, somebody who was writing from Christchurch, New Zealand. Somebody writing, you know, Ontario, uh, 
Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, Michigan. I, that was important to me. I don't, I don't know why. I, I did. Jeff, when he, when he edited, he opened it up to everybody, but I really wanted people specifically from places that were Evil Dead affiliated. Um, and they're great essays. I have to say that uh, really good writing. I'm pretty impressed. Very intelligent, you know, people. So that, that's been really fun to be able to to uh, have such really smart writing about about the the Evil Dead. So I, I was just rereading it again, and I, I really liked that. So, you know, yeah, everybody did a great job. And, and one last thing, Spider Spider Man is of course uh, what made the most money for Sam Raimi. It's it, after Spider the Spider Man films that it's Oz the Great and Powerful. Just fact checking, <laughs> but of course Spider Man. <laughs> oh that thing made a ton, almost like a billion <clears throat> worldwide. Oh yeah, yeah Spider Man will always be Spider Man. But um, anybody ha doesn't have anything out to to say then i guess i'll just wrap it up and just say thank you guys for coming in to talk about uh the many lives of the evil dead again and actually real quick ron so how did that event turn out for your book signing oh my goodness uh, it was two hours of signing in in uh in los angeles and uh betsy baker it was like seriously two hours of signing for her so it was like I, she got mobbed a little bit. Um, it was at Dark Delicacies, Home of Horror, which is a great bookstore. If anybody's a horror fan, you should definitely go there. Uh, I had breaks, so it was it was fun for me. But I, I mean, it was kind of like nonstop for her. So she, uh, she, but I think she likes it. It was just, I think, uh, and I asked them what was the biggest uh, turnout they've ever had in the history of their store, and they said biggest turnout. Actually, who do you think it is for horror? Who do you think the biggest line was? Is they, and they get everybody there. Throw a guess at Paul. Hmm. What do you say? What I'm you not say Helen? <laughs> What's that? Oh, you biggest your... tour turnout. Stephen King? No. <laughs> well, that's the only pe person they haven't got. She said they've gotten everybody but Stephen King. Uh, but oh. actually, Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was in town too. When he was at the Monster Palooza, but yeah, it went great. And you know, Betsy Baker is like just a sweetheart. She's she's just so nice. And then we had William Vincent, who was the fake Shemp, was there too. And then me and the, oh. the co-editor. I'm really hoping to set up something uh, North Carolina side, you know, Tennessee area uh, for Halloween. Um, so uh, yeah, a little bit too fun. early. I'm finding. Yeah, it's a little bit too early. I'm finding the book. They're kind of wanting me to get a little bit close because that's kind of a bit far off so in this i think this summer i'm gonna try to finalize it with but it's fun i love this i was telling you this last time uh paul is like horror people are great they're just like nice people there's there's something sort of relaxing to people who are in the horror you, you, you uh it was sort of surprised me that, but uh, i mean even when we were at signing all the books the people came up to me were just like the nicest people they'd have some like uh the, the shirt of somebody being killed on it <laughs> but then they would be oh yeah it's like <laughs> pol most polite <laughs> human being <laughs> oh yeah I, I i find the horror community to be one of the most friendliest type of yeah community more than any type of community out there to be honest like i mean i don't think i've ever ran into any fan that was just like oh you don't like this album i'm gonna fight you uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's funny>. <laughs> <laughs> or like in this case it would be like oh you don't like this horror album or i mean horror album well in this case yeah i guess you could talk of like soundtrack you don't like this favorite soundtrack by this guy you don't like this uh, movie like like what the hell I'll meet me outside at in five minutes like you know we don't get that it's just like oh okay well that's cool yeah i mean you know like we can go on about like, yeah, well, I like it because of the practical effects or whatever. But I mean, it's 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 just always nice that the horror community does not shove a shove word down our throats. I guess. But at the end, thank you, thank you very much for having me on the podcast, not once but twice. And uh, yeah, Vincent, just thanks to everybody. I, got, I do got to get going now, though. But but uh, I do appreciate it very very much. Thank you. Hey, thank you very thank you very much. Thank hey, you. you're very welcome. And if you guys ever need to come back on to talk Evil Dead, you're more than welcome to. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. And on that note, guys, thank you so much for listening. And as always, make sure you stay scary.